Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt unto every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorted on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Prepare our hearts for the study of God's word. Each of us have the opportunity to Confess all known sin before the Father, uh, preparing our hearts for the study of God's word, and then asking that he might teach us specifically. And this is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, how grateful we are that you have given us your word, given us your word in our own tongue that we might study and that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for brothers in Christ who encourage us in our study of your word. We thank you, Father, for each one gathered here, uh, each one ministering to each other. And I thank you, Father, for them. And I pray now, Father, that as we uh, Fix our attention upon your word that your Holy Spirit will teach us according to the need of our moment. For we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're at the point of God's righteousness, uh, spelled wrong, revealed in transformed living. I can't still stand spelling ears. Um, and we're at the second point, that God's righteousness is revealed in Christian ministry in verses 3 through 8, which is our text for this evening. And we'll start off with honest evaluation, which is verse, verse 3. Look with me where it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt unto every man the measure of faith. In introducing the subject of the use of spiritual gifts, Paul encourages you and me to be humble in our exercise of those varied gifts and those varied opportunities which God has given to each one of us based on our measure of faith. Paul was writing to the Christians who were active members of the local congregation in Rome. When we look at to the church at Rome, we, I remind you that we are looking at several congregations meeting in one huge town, the city of Rome. It's not one church that's meeting in some large auditorium, but several small churches that are possibly meeting in homes or, or buildings that they could find. Um, he described their relationship to each other in terms as members of a body. He used that same picture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 16. The basic idea is that each believer is a living part of Christ's body, and each one has a spiritual function to perform. Each believer 
as a gift or gifts to be used for the building up of the body of Christ and the maturing of its members. In short, we belong to each other. We minister to each other. Don't miss it. We need each other. What are the essentials for spiritual ministry and growth in the body of Christ? It goes on into the honest evaluation. Can I come back to that last point? Because I think sometimes you miss it. We need each other. I need you. You need each one sitting at the table around you. Understand, not only do we need one another to minister to us that we might grow in, in our walk, for each one is gifted differently and each one for the purpose of edifying our life. But you need others as well that you too might minister to their lives and to utilize the gifts that God has given to you. We need each other. It almost makes me shake my head when I hear people say, well, I'm not getting much out of that church service. I don't know if I'm going to go back. Oh, if you're not getting much out of your church, beloved, then obviously God put you in that church for the purpose of ministering to them. Got me? It isn't a consumer mentality that we have as Christians. Oh, but we do, don't we, in the 21st century. Oh, I like this preacher. I like that music. I like this thing. That's my favorite song. I don't like that song. We're consumers rather than worshipers. And we are born again Christians for the purpose that we might minister what Christ has asked us to minister. You have an integral job in your church Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And I trust Thursday as well that you might sense that we're ministering to one another. Not that I'm standing before you and ministering to y'all, but that each and every one of you are ministering to one another. You can't believe the power of your smile at certain times to encourage your brothers who are sitting at the tables around you. You know that's true, don't you? Because you've sensed that when someone has, has uh, ministered to you in this time. But let's look at this honest evaluation in verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to, as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Most commentaries jump in really fast and point out to you that three times he uses, Paul well, uses the word to think. Um, one particular um, translation used the word evaluate. He went through with this, for I say through the grace given me to every man that among you not to evaluate himself more highly than he ought to, but to evaluate himself soberly. You see how that is? And it's very in line with the, with the text. Each Christian must know that his spiritual gifts are, and he needs to know what ministry or ministries he is to have within his local congregation. It's not wrong for a Christian to recognize gifts in his own life. It's not wrong to recognize the spiritual gifts in those around you. What is wrong is the tendency to have this false evaluation of ourselves. I think that comes pretty naturally for a lot of believers. If you were to evaluate yourself, say, if you put your, your church on some kind of a scale as to spirituality, would you put yourself in the bottom of the pile spiritually in your congregation, or would you put yourself toward the top? It's more natural for us to put ourselves more toward the top and feel like we really are in, uh, integral 
we are important. And yes, the gifts we have are important, but Paul warns us not to think, not to evaluate ourselves more highly, but that more in a sober manner, soberly, according to God hath dealt to every man the measure of his faith. The tendency to have false evaluation of ourselves, uh, nothing causes more damage in a local church than a believer who has overrated himself and tries to perform ministries that he was never appointed to do. Sometimes the opposite is true, though, also. I warn. People undervalue themselves as well. Forget what God has called them to do. They don't see their ministry to their co local congregation as on par with their pastors. Why? Stop and think. I remember in, in, in a church I was pastoring and, and a guy said to me, well, you know, we each have our part in the body and, you know, you're like the head here of the church. And then I said, whoa, the head is Jesus Christ. The Lord is the head. <clears throat> Pastor, teacher, I think I'm like the stomach that takes the food and digests it and makes it palatable for those around me. Do you see? Not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to is his warning. Nor think of yourself more lowly, but understand soberly what God has called you to do. The gifts that we have are given because of God's grace. They must be accepted. They must be exercised by faith, Paul tells us. We are saved by grace through faith, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. And we must live and serve by grace through faith, as he says in this text. Since our gifts are from God alone, we cannot take the credit for them. All we can do is accept them and use them to Christ's honor. When the individual believers in a church know their gifts, and they accept those gifts by faith, and they use those gifts given them for the glory of God, then God can bless in a marvelous way. We must be careful that our pride does not interfere in that process. Honest evaluation. And second, faithful cooperation. Verse 4 through 8. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of another, one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy or prophesy according to proportion of faith, and on down he goes through the seven uh, gifts that he lists. Each Christian must know what is his spiritual gifts. What is his ministry? We need to know that. And we need to recognize that each of us have differing gifts. God has bestowed those gifts so that the local body can grow in a very balanced way. We need to be clear on what we're talking about when we speak of the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts we receive from the Holy Spirit of God are not to be confused with any inborn talents or natural inclinations we may must have. Do you hear me? It isn't we brought this to the table and he made a gift out of it. It's not our own um, inborn talents. We sometimes absolutely cloud the subject when we declare that the little boy that chatters a mile a minute has a quote, natural gift for gab and will one day grow up to be a preacher. <laughs> we say those things in dangerous ground. That's not how it works, brother. And in fact, your God-given spiritual gift is 
nothing that you had before you were saved. I'm going to say that again. Your God-given spiritual gift is nothing that you had before you were saved. Preacher, I don't know if that's true or not. I've seen people that, you know, kind of, we saw from, from even from a youth what direction they were going and that sort of thing. Whoa. What's occurred? Oftentimes, we see a young man growing up and we, we put some sorts of thoughts into us as to what sort of gifts he's going to have when he becomes an adult. Poor, poor kid ain't even born again yet, but we're already calling him this or that. What an evangelist he'll make. My, what, he has the gift of helps. He's willing to put his hands in on any gift. We put things upon these people and then they grow up with that expectation of how they must behave and oftentimes start doing things that they never received a Holy Spirit gift to do. Are you hearing me in this? It's a dangerous, yeah. dangerous thing that we get into. It's not a proclivity. It's not a predisposition. Nor are we speaking here of special skills that we might acquire through long hours of study and practice. If you study enough, one day you'll be a preacher. What are we saying? What are we implying? Charles Ryrie, um, in talking about the spiritual gifting and such, um, he gives some warnings. He says, what is it? A spiritual gift, according to Charles Ryder, spiritual gift is not a place of service. The gift is ability, not where the ability is used. Teaching can be done in or out of a formal classroom situation in any country in the world. Helping can be done in the church or in the neighborhood. It's not a place of service. Second, the spiritual gift is not an office. Get ready, deacons. The gift is the ability and can be exercised whether one holds an office in a local congregation or not. To regard to much confusion exists over the gift of pastor. The gift is the ability to shepherd people. This can be done by the person who occupies what we call, in our modern church life, the office of the pastor. Or it can be said, done, say, by a dean of men um, in a school, or it can be done by a family member at home. And then third, a spiritual gift is not a particular age group ministry. Buckled seatbelts, I hope. There is no gift of youth work or children's work. I agree with Ryrie 100% on this and have seen this played with in congregations. There's no youth work or children work gift. All ages need to be served by pastors, teachers, administrators, helpers, etc. And then a spiritual gift is not a specialty technique. There's no spiritual gift of writing or Christian education. There's no spiritual gift of music. These are techniques to which spiritual gifts may be channeled. And then third and final, uh, fifth and finally, a spiritual gift is different from a natural talent. I've already mentioned that a talent may or may not serve the body of Christ, while a spiritual gift does. Let's notice some fur further contrasts, and then he goes to show natural talents as opposed to spiritual gifts. Excellent book. If you don't have this on your shelf, you probably should have this on your shelf. Basic Theology by uh, Dr. Charles Ryrie. Spiritual gifts are given by God's Holy Spirit to all born-again believers. There's a number of various gifts, most of which are mentioned in Scripture. As a child of God, you have one or more of those spiritual gifts. Those gifts were given for the edification of the church 
and or for the furtherance of the gospel through evangelism. The spiritual gifts cannot be inherited from another, nor can they be given to another. They can, however, develop, mature through use. A clear distinction to be made between the gift of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, what we're talking about today, the former, the gift of the Spirit, was conferred upon the church in answer to prayer of Christ and the fulfillment of the promise of the Father. The latter are granted on individual believers, the gifts, as it pleases God's Holy Spirit. And a similar discrimination ought to be made between the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes those meld in our mind. A gift is imparted from one to another and may remain separate and distinct from them both. A fruit, however, is not something placed upon a tree. Got it? But it's the produce of the tree's life. Fruit is a quality of character which may be produced in every believer's life. But not so the various gifts of the Spirit. They are unique and distributed as the Holy Spirit chooses so as to fit the individual for the function he has to fulfill within the body of Christ. Why do I emphasize this? Well, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that they, quote, came behind in no gift, but they lagged far behind in the fruit of the Spirit. The presence of such fruit in the life of a believer is far more reliable evidence of spirituality than the possession or the exercise of even spectacular spiritual gifts. Our Lord indicated an infallible test. Matthew, six, uh, Matthew 7, 16. By their fruit ye shall know them. Satan can counterfeit and he can imitate spiritual gifts. But he is baffled beyond belief in trying to imitate the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 6 we read this. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, or ministry, to wait our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity, that he rule it with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Paul then applies what he had just said in verses 3 through 5 to the exercise of God-given abilities for spiritual service, verses 6 through 8. He built on the principle, we have different gifts. Verse 4, remember? Not all have the same. Interesting. Um, I would translate that function uh, better than what's in our text. The grace gifts, kerismata, are according to God's grace, charis. He listed seven gifts. The Greek text is much more abrupt than any other English translation. Let us prophesy it is just supplied in the text, in our English text, to read e easier in English. Because the Greek is a little bit bumpy as you go through that. He mentions one gift called prophecy, verse um, 6. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. A New Testament prophet, like unto the Old Testament prophet, and like unto the apostle, ministered to the church at large rather than to a single congregation. A prophet of old, like Elijah, or a prophet of the New Testament, Agabus, you never see them linked with one single location, but that they move about within that location and they um, use their gift in uh, each, each and every part. Its function was more um, 
in the New Testament a proclaimer than a predictor, more of a foreteller um, than a uh, than a excuse me more of a fourth teller like a preacher than a foreteller like someone um, doing a fortune telling. Although that element was not entirely absent, in Acts chapter 11, if you just slip over there, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 27, we see it in operation. Acts chapter 11. And verse 27. Acts chapter 11, verse 27, we read, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. It goes on and sees how the apostles responded to that warning, that there was going to be a time that there wasn't going to be food famines were a whole lot more serious. Um, we, we hardly even know what a famine could be like other than maybe watching some movie or something where a famine's mentioned or reading in some book about a famine. I can't imagine not having food for day after day after day. I, I can't imagine. But Agabus stood up and he told and he warned the church there in Jerusalem and Antioch, that there was coming that, that day of famine. The essential mark of prophecy is that it's God's voice. And God's voice through the prophet is made heard to all who listen. It's inspired speech, therefore. The prophet is moved to um, the utter depths of things of God and spoke for the purpose of edification spoke to exhortation and to comfort. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 31 says, He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. What's edification? What's an edifice? An edifice is a building. Right, right. And so, Edification is speaking in such a manner that those whom you're speaking to are built up. Not so much evangelism that the growth numbers would be more the next time you see them, but it's spiritually grown, that they are stronger believers in Jesus Christ. That's edification. And that is the task of prophecy is to edify the believers. And exhortation, what's exhortation? Well, exhortation is, what we're gonna look at it a little bit in a moment, but exhortation is speaking something, speaking forth something that brings conviction upon people. It's, it's that final ploy in the car salesman's pitch in which he brings you down to the piece of paper with a signature line on it, okay? The commitment. It's the, okay, you've heard it. You know, you know it. Now, what you gonna do? Are you gonna act upon it? Ex an exhorter is one who does that. And then third was comfort. When a heart is, is grieving, when a heart is, is sore, when a heart is weak and been, been possibly wounded, the prophet, when he speaks, brings encouragement. You've seen that happen, even as you've looked at some of the Old Testament prophecies. As you're reading along, and maybe you're a little bit upset in regards to what you've seen on the news, and what, you, what you've seen going on around you, and you think, oh my goodness, is it ever going to get good? And then you start reading, and you see, God is watching, and God has a plan. And so that's where the comfort comes in. You're strengthened by what the prophet has to say. That's the gift of prophecy. And Paul points out here that one's prophesying is to be done in proportion to his faith. The word proportion 
is analogia. Analogia. Analogia um, is a mathematical term. The Greek word, you look up analogy or something like that, to find what it means in the English, but analogia in Greek means to a full limit. Can't go any higher. That's, that's as far as you can go. And so he says in, in uh, in this verse, uh -huh. I changed chapters. No wonder that doesn't look right. Okay, let me get back to Romans. He says in that um, prophecy, let us prophesy according to, according to, and he it translates here, of faith, proportion of faith to the full limit of faith. How far can that faith go? Take it to its fullest limit. That's the word proportion there in your King James. It's analogia, to the, to the nth degree, to the full limit. I read one, one uh, book that I had said, oh, I think you could better translate that by just saying agreement to the faith rather than um, taking it to the far limit of the faith. I, I like the far limit on, on this picture. Yeah, that he uh, prophesied according to the full limit of faith. Can't take it any further. And then we see in verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry or he that teacheth on teaching. Ministry in verse 7. Uh, very common <coughs> um, Greek scholars, come on, wake up. Diakonia. We have an English word. We just voted three of them in. Okay, so we spell it bad, all right? So let's just leave it at that. And the word diakonia means servant. <coughs> one who gives service to another, one who cares for another. It's being translated in the King James here as ministry. And I see no problem between um, using the word service or servant and ministry there. This is one of the Greek words um, that's given Trench says this word represents a servant, yes, but he says it represents the service, a servant in his activity. So it doesn't translate there as the word minister, but it's ministry. You see that? It's actually the servant in his servant. Um, it's the minister in his ministry, the activity. The word therefore refers to the one who serves. The words, let us wait on our, aren't found at all within the Greek text. And that happens quite a bit within this particular section. It's really a rough um, passage of scripture um, by Greek standards. The word ministry, um, don't want to be too technical, but it's in the, lo um, the uh, locative sphere that is the exhortation is the one it, who renders service should render service within a realm uh, an assigned sphere so this ministry isn't okay he just you know he happens to be at walmart and so he ministers no um this gift of ministry here is in the sphere of the congregation of christians in the sphere of the body of Christ. It has purpose. It's not just help anybody that comes down the pike. It's, it is focused for the edification and the strength of the church of Jesus Christ. The exhortation that one renders service needs to be within that sphere, needs to be within that realm for which 
uh, God has given him that gift. Uh, the Greek scholar Mole says in his word, almost, quote, almost any work other than that of the inspired utterance or miracle working may be included in this. Do you see that? And I hadn't noticed that. And I, then I started looking back through and saw these other gifts that are listening. Yeah, those are ministries, right? They are service. They are allowing God to use them as his servant to minister in this time. That was a good thing to point out. Godet says, an activity of practical nature exerted in action, not just in word. He puts a differentiation between this word diakona, uh, diakonia, um, as not just ministering in, in a word, but actually that there's action to back up that word. Hope y'all feel much better next time I see you. You know, none of that kind of stuff. Hope your finances will get worked out somehow. This is the guy that's coming with the finances behind. Uh, ministry is not just the word, but it's backing it up with the minister. And then we go on to the third, teaching. Teaching, in verse seven. Ministry, let us wait on ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. The teacher's function in the New Testament was to interpret the Word of God. It's the God-given ability to explain what the Lord is saying in that passage of Scripture, to bring that in. Like I said earlier, it's more of the, the stomach. It's taking the food and making it able to be digested by those around, more acceptable. Um, to those about them um, in their daily life. Um, and also, it's the God-given ability to explain when something is, I'm not quite catching, <laughs> that was close, but I'm not quite catching what he's saying. The ministry of the teacher, the gift of teaching is to explain that, to answer that question and to make um, that truth uh, understandable and then is to take those truths and apply them to the Christian walk it, that is the application part of teaching the teacher never originates his own message but through study and the spirits light upon that study divine truth is made clear to the people of God and then fourth, exhortation. <clears throat> Verse eight, or he that exhorteth on his exhortation. Exhortation. Exhortation takes a message. It points it at the heart and the will. Uh, both words are in the locative sphere again. This is a centralized thing. It's the idea is being for the edification of the congregation, the believers being that one who is given the gift of exhortation should remain within the exercise of that gift. It's a wise man who stays within the sphere of service for which God the Holy Spirit has fitted him best and doesn't evade some other field of service for which he's not very well suited. In the old days, and I mean back in the old days in the 1800s and such, the Baptist churches here in the United States um, were structured a little bit looser than they are today. However, the structure of it always, most always, contained an exhorter. People would recognize, oh, so-and-so, he's got the gift of exhortation, doesn't he? Well, yeah, he really encourages people. He talks to somebody, oftentimes he talks to somebody that's cold against the, the gospel and by the time he's done talking they're on their knees asking Jesus into their heart he is a real he can he can transform a message and he can hit the heart and he can drive into the man's will 
And so Baptist churches used to have a preacher, notice the terminology, used to have a preacher who would preach. Wasn't necessarily always the same man, but they'd have someone preach. And then after he preached, he sat down. And then an exhorter would stand into the pulpit. Yeah. You know, I think that's a really smart idea. The exhorter, oftentimes I have heard ministers of the gospel present a gospel <coughs> message so clear that I just know people are going to come forward and respond to this. Whether it be unto, uh, unto non-believers for salvation or whether it be unto the church for getting on fire or getting in line with what the Lord wants. And yet, he doesn't know how to land it. And he closes in prayer and we all go home feeling like something didn't quite happen that should have. That's when in the olden days in Baptist churches, the exhorter would step up there and he'd call them, call them sometimes even by name in the village, calling them to a saving grace, calling them to a new life with Christ, calling them to a, a more um, deep commitment with the Lord. Preacher, we know what they do. An exhorter, do you know what they do? Yeah, they apply it and they call the person to the altar. And then fifth, giving. Verse 8. All that he exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with, this is odd, simplicity. He that giveth. Um, that word is um, metatididomai, which means to impart one's earthly possessions, to have something in hand and to hand it to someone else, to impart your possessions. It's contributing to people's needs. Needs is to be done with generosity. Uh, Paul says here, simplicity. The Greek word that he uses there is singleness. Singleness and sincerity. A mental honesty. The virtue of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy opens up the heart of one. Um, let me share with you. Um, yeah, I should probably share this. One is free from pretense and hypocrisy. The opening of the heart manifests itself by benefactions and liberality. Uh, Thayer points out a cognate word, and I'm going to give that to you. I was wondering if I should or not. But it's hoplos. This is done by uh, one of those numbers, okay? You may it say hoplos. Hoplos. And hoplos um, is used in James chapter 1, James chapter 1 and verse 5. James chapter, it, it agrees perfectly with the word in our text. James, James chapter 1 and verse 5. We read, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men hablos, liberally, and abradeth them not, shall be given to him. God, in his giving to us as believers, he gives with liberality. Um, it's been pointed out when, when uh, Thayer pointed this out, he said this liberality that's in the King James Version in James chapter 1, seriously, you can translate it simply. You can translate it openly, frankly sincerely that's the matter in which god gives and he wants those with the gift of giving to give in the same manner and then number six in verse eight i put down administration you see on my list behind me administration he 
he that ruleth with diligence. Ruleth. The Greek word for ruleth is he who is placed in the front. Oh, that's just a little bit different than what I'm... Rulers, uh, I have dictating things. Ruler, I have, see, making plans and saying you got to do them. Okay, that's a ruler. All right. But the word that is actually used there in the Greek is a leader. One who steps to the front. And he walks and others follow behind him. You see the beautiful picture that he gives here in verse 8. He says, he that leadeth, let him be diligent in his leadership. Um, it's referring to anyone that's placed in the position of authority. That's why I use the word administration on my list, because that's actually what it is. An administrator doesn't call down orders from the top. An administrator sets the path. And others follow in that path and say that's a good path that we're following. Um, usually we see it as authority. Usually we see it as superintendence. It's really just getting front and line. He must do this with diligence, says Paul, which is the Greek concept, quote, to make haste, to do one's best, to take care, to desire. All of that's within that Greek thought. The idea of making haste, being eager, giving diligence, putting forth the effort in, in that word. It just fits the guy that gets right in front, doesn't it? That he should have an excitement about what he's doing. Not a, oh, come on, everybody, won't you follow me? It's a whole different scene where he has got an excitement um, about him. Um, intense. Uh, the idea of making haste is actually the word is speaking of being intensely focused upon something. One who leads. And then seventh and following. Uh, finally, we read about mercy. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The word there for mercy is el a a o and a l o in the greek means compassion it means feeling um, i don't want to go as far as sympathy but it's the it's the feeling and actually feeling what the other person is feeling and therefore you step in you, you can't stand back and watch it has that compassion uh, feeling it like the other person is feeling um, he says, for us to have this compassionate feeling, it should be with our King James's cheerfulness. Um, that word is hilarotes, hilarotes, um, cheerfulness or readiness of mind. Our word hilarity comes from the word for um, cheerfulness here. Hilarity. Vincent defines the word joyfulness. He says amiable grace. The affability of going the length of gaiety which makes the visitor of a sunbeam penetrating into a sick chamber. It's the bringing light into a dark spot. Bringing joy into a discouraged group of people. When you're giving mercy, the person usually is in difficulties and needs rendering of some help, and that's what the mercy comes in. And the best way to express that is through this joy. Bring light with you, in short, and into the heart of an afflicted, bring joy. These uh, three of these gifts that we've looked at, we had seven gifts, we looked at three that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Prophets, teachers, and administration. Two of them, prophets and pastor teachers, are included in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the 
context that I mentioned at the beginning. And two, administering and serving are listed in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. Whatever one's gift, you should exercise it faithfully as a steward from God. Spiritual gifts are tools with which to build, not play toys, to play with, or weapons to fight with. Let me re-emphasize one thing. You have gifts. You have at least one. You have it because the Holy Spirit has given it to you. And if you're sitting scratching your head and saying, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. The easiest thing to do is to talk to other brothers and sisters around you. Because oftentimes, others will see your spiritual gift with clarity, where you might see it um, just mixed in with some other things. You need to know what your spiritual gift is and begin utilizing it for the edification of the church, for the strengthening of God's body. And you may have several gifts um, you need to place each and every one of them into place. But you may say, you know, hey, things are going too smooth. I hate to mess things up. Nobody's asked me about my gifts. Nobody's talked to me about what I should or shouldn't do about this. So I'm just as happy just the way I am right now. Let me tell you, you are a body you are in the body of Christ. You are a member of the body as this text gave. Just as my thumb is a member, and it would be the rest of me is just as interested if it gets smashed by a hammer, right? Because it's a part of the body. But what if a part of my body decided, eh, I've done enough, I'm tired, I, I, I'm finished. I had such a part this last week. <laughs> what they call the widow maker. What a nice name. The widow maker is that, that artery that's on the top side of your uh, heart, right on the face of the heart. It brings blood to the heart. Well, hey, it was still there. I mean, it didn't go anywhere. A member of the body, it still is, right? It was a week ago and it is a right now. It didn't go any place. Got me? It just got 90% blockage. Now before you start getting upset that that taking a, uh, you know cutting down the blood flow to your heart through that widow maker um, by 90% that could cause me some damage. I'm here to tell you what the, what the widow maker said to me. Hey, brother, what's your problem? I'm tithing. <laughs> you may think you're a small part in the body of Christ. Just like that widow maker is a small part in my body. And you may be thinking that what you're doing is, oh, it's, it's enough for today. Seriously, this is going to kill me and bring me down because I needed that heart to keep beating. Every Christian, every Christian must exercise the gift. How? By faith, he said in verse 3 that we might not see the result of our ministry, sure, but the Lord sees it, and he's the one who blesses us. Note that exhortation, encouragement, is just as much a spiritual ministry as preaching or teaching. Giving and showing mercy are also important gifts. To some people, God grants some the ability to rule or to administer and the various functions of the church. <clears throat> Whatever gift we have, we must dedicate it, not just a portion, but all of it to God and use it for the good of the whole church until he comes again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
Thank you, Father, for the sweetness of this time, for the opportunity to open up your word. Thank you, Father, for giving us this list of gifts that you have given by your grace. And that some of those, uh, we sense that uh, we have that gift and need to utilize that gift more and more in the building up of your church. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing. Thank you for these men. I pray, Father, that you might touch their hearts, that they might know what gift you've given them, that they might use it 100% in Jesus' name.